Hello everyone and welcome back to Dirty 20s D&D. My name is Kieran and I'm the DM on these parts. That means I know all the tricks to make characters way too strong for their own good. And I like to think that I'm pretty good at guiding players to making the best decisions to balance their creative freedom and their character's effectiveness in the game. Today we're going to be talking about 10 powerful character builds at various levels and how you can balance their power for your playstyle. Number one is a level one character I've succinctly called Fighter Man. First, begin by going with human as your race and use the optional variant human traits as those allow you to gain a feat. With that feat, take Great Weapon Master. This will be integral to the build working. For your one level, take it in, you guessed it, Fighter. Choose the Great Weapon Fighting fighting style and your background doesn't really matter. So you can go with Soldier or Outlander or something, whatever makes sense for your character. Where this comes together though, is that with your starting equipment, if you choose a heavy two-handed weapon, preferably the Great Sword, you can put out some crazy damage. When you attack with any melee weapon, if you land a critical hit or reduce a creature to zero hit points, you can make an additional attack as a bonus action. Also, before you make an attack with a heavy weapon, you can choose to take a minus five penalty to the roll and deal an additional 10 damage on the hit. So at level one, assuming perfect rolls and stats, you can deal 78 damage in a single turn, with two attacks with a great sword. On average though, assuming you only have one great weapon master uh, penalty attack, like you only take the minus five, uh, have a 16 strength and don't crit, but you do reduce a creature to zero hit points, you will deal an average of 30 damage every turn. Which is nuts for level one. And why? I put it on the list. To level this guy up for later use, you can really do whatever, multi-class into anything. This one, more than any of the others, is a blank slate. You could always just stick with fighter or go into barbarian, paladin, even wizard. There's no wrong choices. Number two is a level two character that I've dunked on by calling uh, a big nerd. First, start by going with variant human again. I know, I know. This is the last one, I swear, but at such low levels that feat is the easiest way to ultimate power. The feat that they can take can be any of magic initiate, fey touched, or shadow touched. It really depends on if you want two cantrips and a level one spell or a level one and level two spell. As Magic Initiate allows you to learn two cantrips and a first level spell from any one class. And the touched ones give you a first level spell of your choice from one of two schools of magic, as well as either the second level Misty Step or Invisibility. Now this is a multi-classed one. One level in one and one level in another. You can really take your first level in either class. What matters um, with your choices is just the saving throws that you get. I think it's best to start with Sorcerer, as they get Constitution and Charisma, and you will need to take the Aberrant Mind subclass when you take this level. And for your background, go with any of the Strixhaven student ones, preferably Prismari or Quandrix, because they're the strongest. But it doesn't really matter. This background gives you access to more spells, but it also gives you another feat, which is the real kicker here. This feat teaches you two cantrips and a first level spell from which you have access to one of two entire classes' spell lists to pick from. For your second level, go with Wizard, which gives you even more spells. All of this said, you will either have 12 cantrips and 11 leveled spells, or 10 cantrips and 12 leveled spells known. At level 2, if you go with that second option, you will actually know a second level spell at level 2, which is normally impossible. You can cast many of these for free once per day, and then with spell slots later on. You are a master of magic at level 2. There is going to be no damage assessment for this guy, but considering that you can cast Misty Step and then drop Burning Hands from the back of a group of enemies, I'd say it's going to be pretty high for level 2. Continuing this guy's path into higher levels, go with leveling him up into a uh, 6 in Wizard and a 14 in Sorcerer. Take the Divination, Evocation, or Scribes subclass for Wizard, and the Metamagic Adept, Warcaster, Lucky, and Tough feats. And that will be the best build for him. Number three is a level three character I've called Vasarant, a reference to the twins from Critical Role, as this character is a multi-class ranger rogue. However, not to get ahead of myself, you first need to start with your race. Go with elf and then wood for your sub-race. This is because of their Mask of the Wild feature that lets them stealth better 
and the extra five feet of movement will go miles with the rogue's cunning action feature. You can also go with the Outlander background to not need to worry about finding food in nature. And then you're set. Take your first two levels in Rogue and gain all the usual benefits. Ask your DM to also give you the optional Tasha's feature, Steady Aim, as well. Then, take your third level in Ranger, asking your DM for the Tasha's favored foe feature, too. Now, all of this taken together, you can do some dumb stuff. At level 3, you can sacrifice your movement and bonus action to Steady Aim, and then make your attack with advantage. So on your first turn, you can deal a max of 33 damage, assuming max stats and rolls, but an average of 11. Where this gets fun though, is after you hit a creature, you can mark them as your favorite foe to deal an extra d4 damage, bumping up your average damage by 2 and your max damage by 8. Eventually at higher levels, with greater sneak attack and favored foe damage, better stealth rolls and eventually reliable talent, you will be the ultimate stealth archer. You can take the assassin rogue subclass and the gloomstalker or monster hunter ranger subclass to boost your damage, crit chances, and stealthing abilities even more. To continue leveling up, stop at Rogue level 8, because the level 9 ability is useless and if you're here, you care about optimization. You could also go up to 11, but I would recommend 8. So consider adding some levels of Fighter once you run out of worthwhile abilities from Ranger and Rogue, or you could just keep leveling Ranger up all the way, because there's some, there's some useful things up there. I would stop just short of the ability that lets you dash as a bonus action because you got that at level 2. Number four is a level four character I actually found online called the Coffee Lock because they're a caffeine addict and a short rest fiend. This one is incredibly free form, but it winds up being really strong. Race doesn't matter. You can go with High Elf, Variant Human, Yuanti, Pure Blood, Satyr, anything is fine. But because of the class choices, go with one that works well with magic. Your background also doesn't matter. You can go with the Strixhaven one to get, your, uh, get a feat and some spells, or you can go with something that fits more with your character. But the class levels, those are everything. First, start with going by two levels in Warlock. The subclass doesn't matter, so go with whatever fits your character. And then take the second set of two levels in Sorcerer. And again, the subclass doesn't matter. Going with Warlock first isn't necessary, but it does mean you get better weapon and skill proficiencies. If you go with Sorcerer, though, you get Constitution and Charisma saving throws. So there's a choice. I'd recommend Warlock. But why these classes? Feels kind of random, right? Well, if you think about it, the meshing with them does not stop at having the same spellcasting ability of Charisma. It actually goes quite a bit further. If you're fully rested, you have two first level Warlock slots and three first level Sorcerer slots. You then convert your Warlock slots into Sorcerer points and short rest, meaning you have four points at Sorcerer level two and your full Warlock and Sorcerer slots. You can then do it again. You have six points and full slots. You can then use those points to replenish your Sorcerer or Warlock slots as you use them. Well, no, just your Sorcerer ones. And this is essentially a way of bypassing the long rest to get back Sorcery points. At higher levels, this gets even crazier, but for now, it's a useful way of having metamagic options more accessible, or at least it will be at level 3 Sorcerer when you get metamagics. So again, a magic one, no damage assessment, but you can make your magic last longer than most, so it will be good for the level. For leveling this guy up, stop at level 9 Warlock and fill up the rest of the 11 levels with Sorcerer. Take as many free casting spells as you can, as well as the metamagic Adept feat, and always think two steps ahead when in combat. This build is complicated, and can rapidly become less than optimal, so always consider whether or not you need to convert those slots, or if you really need to use that spell or metamagic now. This is a calculator, and you must be calculating with it. Number 5 is a level 6 build that I've called the Teleporting Brick Wall, and it's complemented very well by wizards, but if you don't have one with you, it's not the end of the world. Start by going with any race, but I'd actually recommend Tiefling for this one, with the Zerial subrace specifically for its spell choices of Searing and Branding Smites. Then go with the Acolyte background. That's not essential, but it does kind of complete the character, and you'll see more once I reveal the classes. You start your levels with one in Paladin, this way you'll get the proficiency, best proficiency build out. And then take any combination of one in Cleric and four more in Paladin as you level up. When you take that level in Cleric, go with Forge as your subclass. When you hit level three in Paladin, go with Ancients as your Oath. When you hit level four in Paladin, go with the Crusher feat. 
and that allows you to push creatures you hit with bludgeoning damage up to 5 feet, and if you crit a creature with bludgeoning damage, all attacks are made with advantage against them until the start of your next turn. Make sure you use a Warhammer as your weapon, and also go with the biggest, heaviest armor you can get, and a shield. Use your cleric ability to give your armor or weapon a plus one, it depends on the campaign, but I'd recommend the weapon one until you get a magic item for yourself, and then switch your boon over to the armor. This build specializes in one thing, massive damage to everything and everyone, and being unstoppable the whole time. It does so like this. As a level 5 paladin, you can cast Misty Step. You also get the ability to Divine Smite at le uh, second level paladin, and you can use your cleric slots to do that as well. I know uh, at th that at this level it's not optimal, but it's close enough, and soon enough it won't matter anyways. At this level, assuming perfect stats and rolls, and that you're attacking a fiend or undead, you can deal 85 damage in a single hit, and you can do that twice in a turn, so 170 damage. And when I said that this pairs well with Wizard, when I played this character, they would cast Enlarge on me. So I was an 11 foot tall, walking tank, with an AC of 20, and an average single hit damage output of 28, usually hitting both times on my turn because that character was stupidly strong. And it only goes up from there. As you level up Cleric and get more spell slots, you can also use those to smite too, and your Paladin levels will eventually make you resistant to all spell damage. You're a beast. Leveling this build up further takes it to a total of 9 levels in Paladin and 11 in Cleric. Take the Charger, Mage Slayer, and Shield Master feats, and at the end of the game you will be a 15th level spellcaster, so you'll have plenty of smites and an 8th level spell slot to cast something dumb like Guiding Bolt. Remember, smite damage caps at 5d8 or 6d8 if it's against a fiend or undead, so don't spend too high of slots on smites, and rain heaven on those who dare to say a foul word against your god. Character number 6 is a level 9 build I call the Distinguished Gremlin. Start by going with Stout Halfling and take the Outlander background. Then start by taking a level in Fighter for the proficiencies and fill the rest to be a total of 4 levels in Fighter and 5 in Barbarian. Take a Long Sword and Shield, by the way, as your weapons and you don't need armor unless it would work better than your AC from without it with your Barbarian levels. At fighter level 1, go with the dueling fighting style, and at level 3, go with the samurai subclass. At level 4, take the slasher feat. At barbarian level 3, go with the beast subclass, and take the tough or shield master feat at level 4. Doing all of that means that you're an animal at times, and an honor-bound warrior at others. It all depends on how mad they make you. This is more of a fun one than anything, don't get me wrong, it's still powerful. This one can heal itself, attack without weapons or armor, and ignore poisons and difficult terrain. It's a little freak and it knows it. Your slasher feet works well with your claws and your sword, so it's always optimal, and you can deal a max of 50 damage in a turn and an average of 26. To keep this one going, finish all the way with Barbarian. It would be a waste to keep going in Fighter because extra attack and it's all whatever. You don't need to worry about it fully 16 in Barbarian. Take the Sentinel feat at Barbarian level 8, the Savage Attacker feat at level 12, and either the Tough or Shieldmaster feat, whichever one you didn't take from earlier, at level 16. And that's the character. Character number 7 is a level 12 character called the Six Fists of Fury, and it can be very strong. Start by going with Tiefling as your race and take the Glacia subrace, and then take the Sage background. Why? Because it's neat, and it really doesn't matter at this point. You're level 12, backgrounds, it's whatever. Then take your first level in Fighter and fill the rest out so you have a total of 3 levels in Fighter and 9 in Monk. Grab 2 short swords and no armor, obviously. When you take that first level in Fighter, go with the 2 weapon fighting or unarmed fighting styles. And then at level 3, go with the Battlemaster subclass. For Monk, go with Way of Mercy at level 3, the Dual Weaver feat at level 4, and the Sentinel feat at level 8. Starting at the top, go invisible with your racial spell, sneak up behind them, attack with your swords, attack as a bonus action by spending a key point to hit twice, and then action surge to hit two more times. Six attacks total. Using the optional rules and Tasha's, the subclass abilities, from both Way of Mercy and Battlemaster and the fighting style and feats, you can deal a maximum of 151 damage in a turn, but your average damage is going to be about 35 per turn. Take into account, though, that as you keep leveling, you can replace the sword damage with your unarmed, and this damage is not centralized to one creature. 
A monk's best combat is one with a lot of little goons, because they can attack so many times, but deal relatively little damage. They can defeat swarms much easier than big foes. No, those they just stun and run away from and wait for the wizard to fireball. Oh, also, your AC is going to be stupid. With the dual wielder feat, you get an extra plus one, so just standing nude, holding two swords, you get an AC of 21. If you get anything like a cloak or ring of protection, an Ayun stone or tome of knowledge that raises your stats above 20, or you take the magic adapt feat and grab shield, you're going to be impossible to hit. Because also, on top of all of that, you're a battle master, so you can repost and parry as well. So yes, the Fists of Fury may be individually weak, but together they are strong. To keep leveling this one up, go Monk to 16 and Fighter to 4 to grab that feat, or you can go Monk to 17 to get the subclass Capstone and leave Fighter at 3. Look into it to see what's worth it more for you. The Savage Attacker, Martial Adept, and Tough Feats cannot go amiss here, so when you have options, look at those. Of course, it's entirely up to you. Okay, so character number 8 is going to be something special. It's a level 14 build, and I call it the Master of Dice. Start by going with Halfling as your race, and you can choose either Lightfoot or Stat. For your background, you can go with anything really, but Hermit will probably make the most sense since this character kinda gives off that vibe. But you really can take your first level in either class. We're gonna be multi-classing again. But in the end, total a level 3 Wizard and 11 Rogue. With this build, it won't matter. At level 2 wizard, go Divination, and make sure to take Silvery Barbs as soon as you can. And for Rogue, go Arcane Trickster at level 3, take the Lucky Feat at level 4, the Bountiful Luck Feat at level 8, and either an Ability Score Improvement, the Skilled or Skill Expert Feats at level 10. Your choice. Now, why is this build so good? It's because at level 14, not only do you have two portents from Divination Wizard, allowing you to roll some dice when you finish a long rest, and automatically assign those rolls when you need them, but you also have the Rogue's Reliable Talent, meaning any skills you're proficient with, you cannot roll lower than a 10 on. You also have access to Silvery Barbs, causing other creatures to fail and you to succeed more. And then you have the Halfling ability to never roll a natural one unless you roll another natural one after it, but come on. The lucky feat to also reroll three times a day, the bountiful luck feat to let your allies reroll, and you're as lucky as they come. And everyone should fear you for it. No damage assessment, but do you need one? This is a, this is a troll build, a way to never have to worry about dice in a game that's playing dice, but um, yeah. To keep leveling this one up, just take more levels in wizard, maybe grabbing that level 12 in rogue for that feat, more spell slots for Silvery Barbs is never a bad thing, and more feats is also never a bad thing. Build number 9 is a level 17 character called the DM's Bane, and it's the one that you've been expecting this whole time. For your race, choose Kalishtar. You will have advantage on wisdom saves, yes, but the resistance to psychic is what we're looking for today. Your background does not matter for this one. For your first level, go with Barbarian, and now you've guessed it, fill out your spread so that you're 7 in Barbarian and 10 in Druid. At level 3 Barbarian, go with the Totem Warrior and choose Totem of the Bear, and now when you're Raging, you're resistant to all damage, including Psychic, due to your race. At level 4 Barbarian, at level 4 Barbarian, go with the Tough Feet, and at level 6 Barbarian, go with the Eagle Totem. This means you no longer have disadvantage on any perception checks, regardless of light, since you get Dark Vision from your race. At Druid level 2, go with the Circle of the Moon subclass. At level 4, go with the Sentinel Feet. And at level 8, go with Martial Adept, Great Weapon Master, or the Polar Master Feet, depending on your spread. And now, you're unstoppable. Yes, you can't cast spells when you're raging, but who cares? Rage, Wild Shape, Reckless Attack, be invincible. That easy. You can even become an Elemental since you're level 10 Druid. You can use your slots to regain HP in your form, and when you're out of HP in your wild form, you're still raging, still at full hit points, you got good weapon skills, good hit points, you can't be stopped. To assess this damage is impossible. There are so many choices, so many branching paths, you don't even need to worry about it anyways, you have all the time in the world to defeat your enemies from the sheer wall of hit points that you will be. To keep leveling this one up, grab one more in Barbarian for the feat, and two more in Druid for the other feat. What they are doesn't matter. Fate touched, firearm specialist, chef, you're a god. What do those even mean? 
And then, for our last build, all the way at level 20, the multi-class madness. This is not absurd, no, no, no. This is something special. Start by going with the most powerful race you can think of. I chose Goliath, more for fun, but you can go with Yuan Ti, Seder, Aarakocra, it doesn't matter. Your background also doesn't matter, but maybe consider those from above, like the Strixhaven one or Outlander, and then begin your levels with one in Paladin, and then fill them out as such. Five in Barbarian, three in Paladin, seven in Rogue, and seven in Warlock. Choose a shield, two short swords, a heavy crossbow, and no armor. At level two Paladin, go with the defense fighting style, and at level three, go with the vengeance subclass. At level three Barbarian, go with the totem warrior bear, obviously, and then at level four, take the tough feat. At level three go Rogue, go with the swashbuckler subclass, and at level four, take Sentinel. At level one Warlock, go with Hexblade, and then at level three, go with the Pact of the Blade, and at level four, take the martial adept feat. Take the improved Pact Weapon Invocation, the spells Shield, Hellish Rebuke, Misty Step, and Counterspell, and you're set. You're unkillable. I once used this build to defeat four Ancient Dragons with only one other player, and I still had over half my hit points left. <coughs> Damage on this one can be nuts. Raging, Smiting, Sneak Attack, with Reckless, and an Eldritch Smite, you're putting out max against a Fiender Undead, 240 damage in a single hit, or 328 damage in a turn, or an average damage of 78 per hit and 102 in a turn. Since this is a level 20 build, there is no improving it beyond the use of magic items, epic boons, or homebrew. So if this still isn't enough for you, talk with your DM. They might be willing to help you. And there you have it, 10 powerful character builds for you to use to frustrate your DM and destroy the other character's senses of worth. But now it's time to discuss controlling yourself. Power gaming can be a terrible thing if it's done by the wrong person. Someone who leans into the strengths of a character and plays them as just a sheet of paper that says they're better than everyone else is no fun. It's all about role playing in this game. And so never forget that what you're doing is playing a game. Having fun with your friends. Think about introducing flaws to your character, hesitations for them to overcome. Make them an amnesiac, a hypochondriac, an encephalomo... I don't even know what word I wrote down in my script. And then also consider what made them multi-class in this way. What limits would this impose? A warlock paladin may take from two beings and they may not like each other. A cleric paladin may not always agree with the group. And there's always the option to take non-optimal spells, feats, and abilities. You're not limited to playing the best. And these are just here if you want to understand the choices in front of you better and to try and choose to be stronger in exchange for not playing up, but instead playing down. You will be limiting yourself, but I find that fun. To act with a sense of control instead of desperation to survive. It makes it into a strategy game, and I like those a lot. Thank you all for watching, everyone. I'm not sure what next week's video is going to be, but I'm going to try to post that Solara chapter 2 soon and get more stuff ready for the future. Regardless of what happens, though, I hope you all enjoyed this, and I'll see you again in the next video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and also go check out our Twitch page where we stream weekly. Bye.